Hello and welcome to On Geopolitics, the podcast that looks at geopolitics and historical context with myself, Ali Ansari, and my colleague, Suzanne Rain. It gives us great pleasure to welcome back Brendan Sims, who is the director of the Centre of Geopolitics here at the University of Cambridge and professor of European International History. Brendan has just returned from the Munich Security Conference. Hello. Hello, Brendan. So um, we thought we'd start off by just talking through your main takeaways from the Munich Security Conference. Obviously, it was quite a gathering this year and a critical moment in the war, I suppose. So tell us about it. What are your main reflections? Well, I I think there are really four uh, principal takeaways. One is uh, the question of Germany and the Zeitenwende, which was much discussed. Secondly, the area of non-proliferation and deterrence, uh, which was a pretty major theme. Thirdly, a lot of conversation around what might be Ukraine endgame. And finally, fourthly, the completely different atmosphere that was created by the fact that the Russians, who'd been pretty prominent in the period before the pandemic, uh, were simply not there. Uh, with the exception of a couple of exiles uh, and dissidents. This is all fascinating. Um, and of course, these are all themes that we've been talking about, all the, everyone who's talking about Ukraine, we've all been talking about these throughout the last year, actually, with greater degrees of urgency. Let's start with the Zeitenwender, the sort of German change that Olaf Scholz announced last year. What was the discussion about that and how do you think that's changing? I think it's fair to say that in the plenary sessions, and indeed in the side panels as well, there was a lot of scepticism about the speed and extent of the Zeitenwende, which of course was announced very shortly after the uh, escalation of Russian operations in Ukraine, the invasion proper, because of course uh, the invasion itself had started in 2014. And the Zeitenwende, as you'll recall, uh, really signals uh, the idea that Germany had now definitively broken with the past where it was playing uh, below its capacity, performing under its weight in the military and security sphere. And a a huge uptake, about 100 billion uh, euros of investment uh, on the military side was announced. Now, actually, a great deal less has been done in reality. And the Germans really had to be pressurized into the recent decision to supply the, the Leopard tanks. Uh, And even that seems to be progressing a little bit more slowly than had been hoped. And one could see that dynamic uh, at play in Chancellor Scholz's speech, which began with a resounding uh, message of support for Ukraine. And that was applauded quite uh, intensively and at length by the audience. And then three or four minutes later, having gone through a number of different issues, he then said that... uh, However, Germany would not provide any weapons that would tend to escalate the situation. And at that point, there was I, I think I, I noticed a single clap in the room. There was almost complete silence. So you got a very direct sense of some scepticism in the room, uh, and indeed more generally uh, around the Titan vendor. So that, that was really the principal takeaway. Um, add to that the fact that Germany, despite its hope, did not produce for discussion a national security strategy, which they're deliberating at the moment, for the Munich Security Conference. In fact, that's been announced for March, but I'll believe it when I see it in March. It's more likely, I think, to be after Easter. But it's just another indication of the great difficulty that Germany has uh, around this question of of even talking about strategy. Can I I just jump in there very quickly? What... what do people understand by the term when the Germans say we're not going to supply any weapons that would escalate the situation? What does that mean in practice? Because it, you know, it sounds to me as if we're deliberately getting into some sort of stalemate, if I can put it that way. If you're not providing the weapons for them to do actually anything other than simply stop them losing, in a sense. I mean, what do they mean by that, as you understood it anyway? Well, the kind of weapons they're ruling out, and to be fair, other countries have also been pretty reserved about are you know fighter jets, for instance, and and other technology in in, in that direction. Uh, so anything that, according to their calculation, would serve to provoke the Russian side uh, to greater or more severe or more horrid efforts. There was, however, at the conference, a great deal of unease 
about what appears to be now a strategy of attrition, mm. which is wearing down the Russian Federation rather than going for some kind of uh, knockout blow or at least uh, you know, a serious counteroffensive in the spring uh, and the summer. And the point was being made, not least by the Ukrainian representatives themselves, but also by others, that, of course, the failure to provide more effective weaponry, uh, that failure is being paid for through the blood of Ukrainian soldiers on the front line. It's quite interesting because actually the, the first, well, I suppose that all, all of your points run into each other, but the Seitenwender question and the question of non-proliferation and deterrence are, Seitenwender is the German version of that question, which is what is the best way to bring about point three, the Ukraine endgame. And, and I think it's, it's in Germany that you see that argument being most clearly played out in the public domain because there is such a strong sort of sector which is saying we need peace more than we need mm. to escalate in a way. Can I ask, Ben, was there a sense at the conference about um, the sort of German, you know, the, there have been rifts in the German coalition about this, haven't they, with the Green mm. Party wanting to go further and faster? D was that debate evident? It was. It's pretty clear that the foreign ministry under Annalena Baerbock is much more hawkish, uh, much more activist than the chancellery under Olaf Scholz, uh, and to a certain extent the defence ministry uh, under Mr Pistorius. So that those tensions were were definitely there. They've been patched up a bit, you know, for for the public presentation, but they're obvious. Um, and what, what we're really seeing is uh, really the final collapse of what had been the original German conception of deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Russia, which was to, after 2014, which was to say, yes, we will do some sanctions. Yes, we will do some more military preparations. But essentially, we will enmesh Russia through a series of economic relationships, in particular the supply of energy mm -hmm. through the now notorious Nord Stream project. And that would be the deterrence. That would actually be an incentive for Russia not to escalate. And then there was a general consensus. It's pretty obvious, uh, of course. General consensus at the meeting, even among those who previously advocated that view, that deterrence had failed, that plainly Putin had not been prevented from his attack through this policy, but that also, in a sense, NATO had failed because its policy of deterrence uh, likewise had not had the desired effect. And so one now needed to think more uh, creatively, perhaps, about the kind of guarantees one might give Ukraine in a post-conflict uh, situation, A, and B, to think a little bit about, uh, or intensively, rather, about uh, the question of nuclear deterrence, you know, because there have been quite a lot of fairly mm -hmm. direct or more or less unveiled threats from the Russians that they might use some form of nuclear weapon if their own territory were threatened. And by their own territory, they now mean uh, Crimea and the four oblast in eastern Ukraine. So it actually means that a Ukrainian counteroffensive could, in theory, trigger a uh, Russian uh, nuclear response. So that was quite a lot discussed quite a bit as well. So I'm going to take you back. One more question about Germany, really. Brendan, you and I, I mean, I've spent... Uh, a long time ago, quite a lot of time in Eastern Germany. And that question of the sort of the two Germanys still existing in a way, and, and people who've grown up in the East have a much greater familiarity with Russia and deeper connections with Russia. And this question is not a, I hope it's not a negative one, but we talk a lot in the UK about soft power. Mm. And if, if you take the German position up to the invasion as being it's better to talk to the Russians than not. Um, Germany and Russia have always had to get along with each other in some way. What we seem to not really be sort of talking about is how Germany might instrumentalise those parts of its country which have the deep relations with Russia, which have the understanding of Russia, to, to change the way that Russia's thinking about things. Is there any discussion in Germany about so essentially flipping it on its head? So rather than being seen as being used by the German, uh, used by the Russians as a backdoor into Europe, using mm. Germany as a backdoor into Russia, or or is that just is that simply just not talked about because no, it's not going to work? 
Well, that was the original conception, that it would be a two-way relationship, that they would be in Russia's head as much as Russia was in their heads. And, and there were a number of uh, quite prominent civil society organizations, Germany, Russia Forum, St. Petersburg Dialogue, I think it was called. Uh, and this was both cultural, but also economic and political. But those lines of communication, I think, have broken down. And so what you're really left with is just a fairly substantial, but by no means majority constituency in Germany, which, by the way, is not just in, in the former German Democratic Republic, but also in the rest of the uh, Federal Republic, because, of course, there was a large outflow of German um, Russians and Russians of other origins in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, which, which form a large group also in, in, in places like Munich and and Cologne. And indeed, we were uh, witness to a number of demonstrations, uh, some of which featured Russian flags uh, outside the perimeter of the security conference. This is nothing new. It's quite, it's quite normal for there to be protests at the MSC. But what's uh, sort of an innovation of the last few years has been that strong Russian presence. But I, I don't see any sign, really, that the messages are going from that community to Russia and changing things. But that may simply be because we're not seeing that, and that we would only that would only really be evident once there had been some substantial change. It's the difficulty, really, of assessing what's going on within a you know a non free society. Okay, thank you, Ali. Brendan, I mean, one of the things that uh, you know I'm, I'm getting from from your own comments, but also what I've seen is this sort of gradual shift in the policymaking community away from this idea that you can bring people on board by basically being nice with them. I mean, it's my, you know, my tea with Mussolini, sort of the idea that you mm. can go and sit down and chat and bring them, you know, hug them close. Uh, and that seems to have, you know, obviously there seems to be a rethinking of that with China, obviously, you know, the Russia policy and, and that sense has failed. But we're in this process at the moment that we really haven't settled on what's going to replace this yet. I mean, I, th I think there's a, there's a realization that we have to move towards a different strategy, longer term strategy. But I get the impression, and from what you're saying as well, that also there seems to be a certain amount of bureaucratic inertia in terms of being able to move towards a slightly different way of thinking things. What I, what I wanted to ask more specifically is is how, in a sense, you see the sort of geopolitics of Europe as a whole, and the and the in in a sense the dom. I mean, I was very struck by the fact that, you know that Biden goes to Poland twice this year. You know, I mean, and and Eastern Europe is playing a much much more prominent role in the uh, in U.S. strategy or the approach to Russia. I mean, how do you see? Do you see there's a sort of a shift in the balance, really, in Europe? That I, I mean, so the, I mean, my follow-on question, by the way, to that, when you look at that, is if Eastern Europe is becoming more and more uh, important in terms of that strategy, how does the UK fit into that? Actually, I mean, that's also another interesting dynamic. Yes, so there's been two really interesting shifts observable, which uh, you know are very clear when you compare them to, say, Munich Security Conferences in twenty. 17, 2018, 2019. Uh, in those earlier years, you would hear two messages. One was that basically countries like Poland uh, were regarded as uh, retrogressive socially and essentially outside the European framework. And I'm not, I don't mean to, to critique that critique, so to speak, but in strategic terms, it meant that Poland was on, on the margins. And secondly, that Britain, which was in the throes of the whole Brexit process, uh, was also marginal to Europe. And really that front and center were France and Germany uh, and the other smaller countries. And obviously the United States was, was the overall guarantor. That has now shifted. The United States obviously is still uh, hugely important, but the uh, balance of power has shifted both eastward and northwestward. Mm. So it was very striking that uh, when the prime minister came and gave his speech, he was, I mean, very much uh, um, lauded by all the Ukrainians in the room. One after the other stood up and said, you know, we'd like to thank you for X piece of equipment or Y political initiative. Uh, and that was not the case with any other speaker in the conference. And also the conference releases every year a very interesting report, and it usually has some fascinating statistics or polling uh, information. And they did a pretty uh, detailed poll of Ukrainians, and they asked them, which is your most favorite country? 
and their most favoured country was the United Kingdom with 77%. The United States was close behind with 76 so it's much of a muchness. Uh, but then, and then Canada after that, a few percentage points down. And then there's a pretty large gap of about 20% or so until you got to the other European powers uh, like Germany and France. Uh, and then obviously places like uh, China and South Africa uh, and so on uh, were absolutely uh, right down in, in the pits, as, as you might expect. But the, the popularity of the United Kingdom reflects simply the fact that the United Kingdom has been the biggest military provider among the European powers. Obviously, the United States has been very substantially larger. And you could see a sort of backhanded acknowledgement of this in Chancellor Scholz's speech, because he repeatedly referred to the fact that Germany was the largest military provider within continental Europe, as he very specifically said. Uh. So that was his his way of acknowledging that the United Kingdom, in fact, uh, was the bigger donor militarily. Economically, it's a different question. And likewise, uh, Poland, of course, is now in a much stronger position than it was previously. Uh, it was something of a pariah uh, at earlier meetings and, and more generally in Europe. That's completely changed. Poland is now a bulwark in the East. And the, the balance of power, uh, just psychologically, between Germany and uh, Eastern and, and Northern Europe has shifted. And there's been something of uh, a kind of a, a, a decolonization almost of German views of the region. By that, I don't mean you know, economic or political colonization, but there was a certainly a very strong uh, de haut en bas. Um, uh, there, was a se- there was a sense of a hierarchy, I take it. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that hierarchy, I think, in Europe has been overturned, both with respect to the East and with respect to the United Kingdom. I was thinking about this because we're all of a certain age. And so we, well, I think we are. Um, So we grew up with the Iron Curtain in place. And so for me, there was a sense, proper sense, that there there was a sort of half of Europe that was behind a wall that you couldn't get to. And and even when the wall came down, the barrier somehow is still kind of there in your mind. And, And so all the conversations that we had about Europe in the 80s and 90s was was about the Franco-German motor. It was the, the real centre of gravity was, was France and Germany. And Brendan, I wondered if I might draw on some of your deep historical expertise, because as I was reflecting about that, I thought, although that's the Europe we've grown up with, in fact, that kind of Franco-German motor and the, the sort of division of Europe down the middle is a post-1945 well, I'm just. This is this is a question. You can tell. You can say what you like in in response, but but that is a relatively recent construct. And in fact, if you looked at Europe in the middle of the last century, it looks very different. What what do you think to that suggestion? Well, I think I think that's correct. That the European unification project became a Franco-German one uh, simply because when the iron and steel community was originally set up in in the early 50s, the UK refused to join for for reasons that are perfectly understandable historically. Um, But nevertheless, that gave the new project a particular orientation. And essentially, there was a a grand bargain Mm. between France and Germany, which was that the Germans eventually gave up their dominant currency, the Deutschmark, uh, in return for the euro, and the French would bring in their political and and military heft, and essentially accept Germany's return to the civilized fold, which was the whole the whole purpose of the European project was both to contain Germany as a power, but then also to help mobilize her against what was then the the Soviet threat. So it did acquire this Franco-German axis. Um, I say I use that term non pejoratively. I hasten to add uh, quality. Now that's come under considerable strain over the last few years with the failure of President Macron's uh, attempt to deepen European integration, uh, which essentially was ignored and frustrated by the Germans. And now laterally, with his attempt to create what he calls a European strategic autonomy, which the Germans see as undermining the link with NATO, uh, which they don't want to lose um, because they don't, for understandable reasons, fancy the idea of having to defend themselves. Um, although they are aware, post-Trump, of the dangers of 
American disengagement from Europe. And it was very striking that um, both Macron and Scholz spoke at the MSC, but unlike in earlier years when you had French and German leaders, they didn't actually listen to each other's speeches. Uh, huh. They were quite separate. Wow. Now, there may have been protocol reasons for that or reasons of our pressing engagement, but it did seem to me uh, symbolic of a certain re- rift in the relationship. Gosh, and that's actually, that wasn't what I was expect. I wasn't, <laughs> I didn't, I hadn't picked that up to the to that extent and that it's manifesting at the conference is is really interesting, actually. Do you think, um, so afterwards there was a lot of talk about Macron still basically saying we need to find a way of talking to Russia. So let's mm. let's bring this back to your point three. And we haven't really talked about point two, which was non-proliferation and deterrence. But but if we link that with point three, with, which is the debate about what the end game looks mm. like, because mm. because Macron is clearly, he appears to be on one end of this saying, you know, we've got to talk to the Russians. Tell us how the debate played out. Yes, well, essentially, Macron is to a certain extent part of that, or is allied to that German discourse we discussed earlier, which is one of engagement with Russia. I mean, Macron over the last few years has attempted to uh, some kind of rapprochement with Russia, arguing that Russia needs to be part of the solution, even if it's part of the problem, arguing that the Americans cannot be relied upon, and arguing finally that the really big challenge to everybody is the ambitions of the People's Republic of China. And in that context, Russia is, is a valuable ally. And for that reason, he persisted with his attempts to talk to Vladimir Putin, not only up to the invasion, but indeed for several weeks beyond the invasion. And while that obviously failed, you could see from his statements now at Munich and elsewhere that he still has this idea that we need to cut a deal with Russia, that that Russia needs not to be cut uh, down to size in in some way. So that's still very salient in his mind. And that that viewpoint was roundly condemned by the Poles, the Americans, uh, Brits and others there. So, so uh, the other dimension here is what the Ukrainians think. And, you know, there, there was a lot of uh, discussion of, you know, what would be a possible or a credible ceasefire line you know, would, for example, the Ukrainians accept uh, the loss of, of some of the eastern provinces? Would they accept uh, maybe that they recover those in Mariupol, but would uh, not try to recover Crimea? Uh, all those questions were discussed. The Ukrainians, that is to say Ukrainian people, according to the polling of uh, the Munich Security Conference, would not accept a concession on any of those fronts. So there were figures in, in the high 80s Mm. for continuing the war to recover all of the lost territories in the East and also Crimea. There were even 2% who wanted to continue the war against Russia, even once the Russians had withdrawn from all pre-2014 Ukrainian territory. So <laughs> these were obviously the diehards. So it gave one a real sort of feeling for the fact that, you know, people at conferences like these uh, can say and decide what they want. But the Ukrainian state and Ukrainian people will have a, a very important voice as well. It's, it seems that, you know, again, I mean, you're, what you're expressing about Macron is this sort of this idea almost that there's a sort of a they're sort of anchored in a, in, in a slightly old way of thinking about how to approach Russia. Does he make a distinction between Russia and Putin or does he? I mean, is the argument really saying that we need to talk to Putin? Because, I mean, I would have thought if they sort of distinguish those and sort of say that, well, you know, obviously Russia is going to continue. We can't ignore Russia. But it, it's pretty impossible for us to think about, you know, making any sort of stable peace with Putin. Well, his focus has been pretty much on Putin himself. I mean, that's interesting. Um, there, there doesn't seem to have been much idea, which is prominent in other discourses of, you know, hoping for regime change. That was something that was discussed in the conference at some length. But generally in the context of some pessimism. In other words, most people expected that if Putin left, his successor might well be worse in several respects, because it would be difficult for most of the country and most of the elite to interpret 
Russia's failure in Ukraine in any other way uh, than a betrayal right. uh, and a lack of vigor, which could only be remedied by even stronger efforts. So there wasn't really much hope uh, of change within Russia itself. All, all the hopes really rested on establishing some kind of military balance or even superiority on, on the battlefield. Brendan, I was thinking about this in the context of the speech that Putin gave very recently about, well, on the anniversary. And I get that, you know, it's now being framed as, as a war against the West, uh, a proxy war that we, the West, initiated that's taking place in Ukraine. He obviously has to present it like that. So he may well believe that in his mind, but he has to present it like that because that's the way he retains the support of the Russian people. But of course, the people around him know that Russia invaded Ukraine. So they know that they did it. And even if they might feel that they were justified in doing it for X number of reasons, they do still, they ought to still remember that they did it. So that question of, I mean, this may be impossible f- for you to answer, but that that question of Putin's position, you know, the more he ramps up the anti-American, anti, you know, while that is clearly necessary to build his support at home, there must be plenty of people in Russia now in positions of power who say, yeah, but actually we did do this. And therefore, what happens next? That seems entirely plausible to me, um, but I don't really have any inside Kremlin baseball to offer on this question. Um, And the nature of, of such a regime is that you don't see those kind of cracks until they're basically you know, uh, a terminal. Mm. Um, One of the points that was being made at the conference was that this uh, ramping up the rhetoric you referred to um, might be part of an effort to disengage from Ukraine and possibly launch some other, uh, hopefully from their point of view, easier operation elsewhere. Um, And you've probably uh, seen the discussion around Moldova in the last few weeks. That's the context there, that, that he might decide to uh, to move into Moldova, which would also have the advantage of putting pressure on Ukraine from the uh, West. But the people I spoke to at the conference didn't think that was very likely for a number of reasons, uh, principally that operationally it's very difficult uh, because obviously they'd have to, to move from Transnistria. Uh, there's no direct land bridge. Um, it's right on NATO's doorstep. Um, And it seems generally more likely that Ukrainians would invade Transnistria if it came to anything, rather than the other way around. However, it was put to me that an escalation into Georgia, the Caucasus, or very possibly into Kazakhstan or some other part of Central Asia, that would be more likely. And that if he could chalk up a win there, that might give him an off ramp uh, in Ukraine. But the, the long and short of it was people struggle to see how the fever pitch of uh, nationalism and xenophobia and expectation in Russia uh, was going to be satisfied. Mm. So the question, your point three about endgame, was was essentially just a discussion, coming back to Ali's earlier point, about about whether whether essentially it it is right in any way for us to help the Ukrainians simply enough that it can remain... A stalemate and whether we need to push harder and harder in order to whether sorry whether the West in its support needs yeah. to push harder and harder in order to force the Russians to and the big thing here is essentially about negotiations because you you don't want ever to be in a situation where you're negotiating in a position of weakness so everyone is just be wary of any Russians suggestion to negotiate unless they're being absolutely forced to do it. It, was that, I mean, was again, was that the discussion about when to negotiate? Yes, there was some discussion about this in detail in the side panels. And one of the points that was made there is that we're at the moment uh, statistically in what is likely to be the absolute trough uh, of possibilities for a negotiated settlement. So that uh, it's been demonstrated by scholars that the likelihood of ceasefire negotiations is quite high at the beginning of any conflict. It then drops as there's mutual misunderstanding. And then after about two years, it goes up again. So probably that means, if that's true, in this case, uh, that means that um, peace negotiations over the next six months to a year 
So we've got another year, basically, Brendan, yes, before they that, actually uh, realise they were. Well, I wanted to ask also about the the, the Chinese. Presumably, were um, were touting a sort of a their, their role to be able to mediate. Do you think also their their offer or their ostensible offer to supply weapons uh, to the Russians mm-hmm. as a way to maybe up the ante and encourage negotiations or encourage you know to sort of escalate to force us to mm-hmm. force everyone to the table? Or do you think they're seriously mm-hmm. there's a serious sort of um, military alliance emerging there? Yes, well, it was, of course, uh, Foreign Minister uh, Wang uh, who made the, actually at the security conference this announcement that the People's Republic of China would offer to mediate. Mm-hmm. And then it sort of dribbled out from various sources that the the West believed that, that the PRC was going to supply weapons to Russia. I don't can't look into the minds of the uh, protagonists in, in Beijing. My sense is that they uh, are very unhappy with the war. Um, they're unhappy with the weakening of their ally, Russia. Uh, allies, putting it too strongly, but at least of their, their friend. And they're unhappy about the implications for Taiwan, the general sense that actually a weaker actor can put up a, a strong fight. And they're unhappy with the economic fallout for all kinds of obvious reasons. So I don't think they're trying to wind up and encourage mm-hmm. Putin to resist. I think uh, what they're trying to do is to say that if the the West is the arsenal of democracy and of international law supporting Ukraine, uh, then the PRC will be the arsenal of tyranny uh, supporting uh, the Russian Federation. And so that any hope of a of a nutritional win over the Russian Federation, which is completely credible, indeed inevitable, if it's just between uh, Putin and the West, that's more questionable. Although I think the outcome ultimately still wouldn't be in doubt, but it's definitely a much longer attritional conflict if you've got uh, the PRC propping up the Russians in a systematic economic way, which they haven't been doing so far. I think this is part of a push for a negotiated settlement. Yeah, that's what I was. So that's what they're trying to do, basically, to mm. sort of say to the West that don't think you can sit this out mm. um, because we'll just we'll just back up Putin ourselves. Yeah. And it argues against, I think, any Russian aggression in Kazakhstan, because that's not going to help the Russian China. It certainly won't go down well in Peking. I I don't, well, I don't know. Beijing, Uh, I should say. Yes, Ali. Um, (laughs) Brendan, I'm going to move us on to your fourth point, because then we have to wrap up. The absence of Russians, which Mm -hmm. is, of course, a natural consequence of a war, but also a negative because it means that the divide deepens. there, there must have been some Russians there. Yes. So there were some dissidents. So Jana Nemtsova, for example, uh, Boris Nemtsov's widow, uh, Khodorkovsky was there, I believe. Um, I, I didn't actually go to those panels, um, but there were some exile Russians there, uh, but there were no official Russians. Um, and uh, there were also far fewer of the German, uh, you know, the the... the there's a German outfit called the um, uh, Committee, uh, the Eastern Committee of German Industry, uh, is a rough translation of its title. It seemed a lot less prominent to my eye than it had been in previous years. So through from uh, the time I've attended, which has been from 2016 through to 2020. Uh, and of course, the Russians didn't come in the much reduced uh, meeting uh, last year, which was just before the invasion, which was still somewhat under pandemic circumstances. So the feel of the room in certain cases was very different from before. That Russian voice isn't there, uh, and the sort of Russia whisperers, who were pretty prominent in the past, uh, they had fallen almost entirely uh, silent. There also seemed to be fewer people from the PRC there, but I'm not sure whether that is that was pandemic-related or whether that was a general freeze factor vis-à-vis uh, the non-Western constituency. What about representatives from what we might call, I don't know if this is acceptable, the non-aligned countries? So, you know, India, Latin American countries, South Africa, were they there? They were. There was a, uh, on the Sunday morning, there was a a, a panel. Um, And there's quite a lot of discussion, you might even say heart-searching, on the Western side about the fact that, uh, you know, support for the sanctions, support for Ukraine, was markedly lower uh, 
in the non-aligned space than it was in the West. And there was a lot of support for the idea that, you know, we, we need to, to think more systematically about how we engage that part of the world. Um, so that was there. Uh, th- there was definitely a, a factor. Brendan, thank you. I think we've, I think we've run out of time. Ali, do you have any more questions? No, I mean, I think that's, I think we've covered all the ground. I was just going to, I mean, I, I think you've already answered this, to be honest, but really in the sense that in historical terms, we've really reverted to type effectively, haven't we, with a sort of a US led sort of security structure in Europe and the, the sort of the, the European framework is not really as, uh, not really as effective as, uh, well, it certainly hasn't, uh, it hasn't stood up to the, the task really as, as, as some people might have hoped, has it really? No, abs- absolutely. Um, there was quite a lot of uh, handwringing about this on, on the one side, but also a lot of told you sewing mm-hmm. uh, on the other. Uh, particularly, I think, from the Nordics, Baltics, and Easterners, who now feel completely vindicated in their warnings about Russia and are really sort of, it's payback time to a certain extent, rhetorically at least, uh, vis a vis Germany and some of the other uh, Western European states who had, uh, in their view, and I think also in my view, had completely misunderstood the nature of what they were facing in the East. Brendan, I thought of one final question. So you've argued very convincingly that after leaving the EU, it was in the UK's strong interests that Europe should be stronger and more capable so that essentially the UK didn't have to, <laughs> didn't have to keep doing things for it. What you've just said is is sort of the opposite of, of that. I mean, so the question is, what do you think the UK should be doing to enable Europe now to build its strength, to build its decision-making capability on questions of defence and deterrence? Well, I, I think to be clear, what we've seen is the failure of intergovernmental Europe, mm. less so the failure of supranational Europe. Mm. So to give you an instance of what I mean, the poll uh, of Ukrainians mm. I mentioned earlier uh, and it's um, the beauty contest uh, on the different countries, what was very striking is that the European Union as a whole, the institutions, were marked much more favorably than individual states like Germany and France. So the, the EU as a whole came below the UK, US, and Canada, but well ahead of Germany, France, Italy, uh, and so on. And I think that reflects a certain truth, which is that the European Union supranational institutions, in the areas of competence that they have, which were economic and sanctions and so on, really have put up a a pretty good show. And of course, we're always critical of the Nord Stream projects uh, and other activities. And it's for that reason that I think it would be in everybody's interest, but also the UK's interest, to encourage the supranational movement um, and to discourage the kind of individual member state uh, solo activities, as we've seen, you know, in the case of Mr. Macron in Russia uh, and Germany over the Russia relationship and so on. So I don't think that my viewpoint there has been discredited quite the contrary. But it's quite it's quite a counterintuitive one as far as the UK is concerned, though, isn't it, Brendan? Because I mean, basically, it's not a sort of view that yeah, British I, politicians would necessarily thank want you. to um, be enthusiastic about. They'd want the individual states to be much more influential, mm-hmm. wouldn't they? In a sense, but that's because they are stuck in an old balance of power mindset, yeah. and they're also under the impression that they will be intelligently dividing and ruling uh, among these states. And what we've seen over the past few years is that actually the Europeans or the mainland Europeans or the EU Europeans um, have been pretty divided on issues to do with Britain, uh, which is unhelpful. Um, And the areas where it would be helpful for them to be united, you know, vis-a-vis Russia or the PRC or whatever, uh, they haven't been. And uh, actually a lot of the troubles that occurred during the Brexit process occurred because individual member states caused a difficulty. I mean, think of the Republic of Ireland over the uh, Mm. uh, protocol and the backstop uh, and so on. So, you know, I I think that, um, yes, there are costs uh, to a united, uh, a politically united Europe, but I think what it could potentially deliver uh, would far outweigh those irritations. At the moment, 
we have in some senses the worst of both worlds. And that's a fascinating note to end. Yeah. And on that note, we are going to say thank you very much, Brendan, for your reportage from Munich. And um, we will obviously come back to you in due course. But for now, from Ali and me, that's thank you to Brendan and goodbye. 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 Goodbye.